Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Dust Jackets by Samantha Dutton This is the retirement home of literature. Its residents don't need to be embarrassed of their brittle bones, wrinkled skin, liver spots, and faded scars. Jane Austen invites me to high tea and a turn around the garden. Moby Dick catcalls me beneath a violent stormy sea. Luring me into gothic places, I hear the cries from the victims of Dracula and Frankenstein. Taking care with every fragile page, I show respect to my elders. I am greeted by faces I have always held dear to me. The adventurous Secret Seven gang waiting to solve their next mystery. The watercolors of Tom Kitten and Peter Rabbit, all clad in bonnets and cardigans, peering up at me with innocent eyes. Hmm. I know the mischief they have been causing. I have long kept their secrets. Oh, and that smell. Like sniffing glue. I remember an episode of QI told me that the fungus growing between the pages releases a certain chemical. Some writers even admit to getting a high off it. Ah, I know the feeling. The dilapidated spine of a Dickens book is weakly bound to coarse brown pages. Beyond the faded text, I see an ancient man whose pen and ink body is hunched under the protection of a hefty coat. I don't want to let him go. Curse of the Virgin by Richard Sensenbrenner She falls onto my lap from a second-hand book. She has a look a bit put out about the whole thing, but wouldn't complain. She is a vision in red, white, and blue, standing palms out, her halo unwilling to be upstaged. That hooded cape is a light blue, and the perfectly pleated tunic a plain, unblemished white. What really sticks out, perhaps literally, is the goose-blood red heart. There is no room for lungs, I think, while looking at that huge heart with its own halo. She is anatomically incorrect. I turn her over and the back reads, in memory of Doris, and then some Polish name requiring time for dissection, followed by an invocation to God. These holy cards are a flat commemorative. My mind instantly draws the correlation with baseball cards, old women gathering together to trade a Gladys for an Ethel. Sandwiched in plexiglass is the rare Francine whose wake took place during a blizzard. I turn her back over. She looks like Donna Reed. Not a bad thing at all. Not very authentic. I move to throw her in the waste paper basket, but I can't for some reason. The card sticks in my opposing digits. I can't discard the Blessed Virgin and Doris whats her name I am a Catholic, for Christ's sake. It's only paper. What if I wrote both their names on a piece of paper, crumbled it up, and tossed it? I get out a piece of paper, fumble around for a pen, write their names, and now I have two of them. Reading my book for pages, I ignore them both and wonder why this stuff always happens to me. It's not like they take up a whole lot of space. I can put her with my own collection of dead relatives, maybe. Can I take a total stranger like Doris and include her with my relations? My wandering eyes conveniently notice a library book on the other side of the room. I'll institutionalize her, put her between the pages, deposit her in the drop box, and run like hell. It's a government problem. But now Donna Reed, in her prelude to a habit, looks me in the eye. What if the next person crumples Doris into a ball and tosses her with the eggshells or coffee grounds? I introduce Doris to my dead relatives, and she now resides with them in the very top drawer of my dresser along with a tangle of rosaries and chainless medals. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker-Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. I love National Poetry Month. 
this episode is going to be long enough, and so you do not have time to listen to me talk about how much I love National Poetry Month. I am working on a blog post about my relationship with this particular celebration, so be watching for that towards the end of April on noextrawords.wordpress.com and our social media stuff, but I won't talk about it too much today, except to say that the commemoration that we're doing is different than we did last year. Last year we went through a submissions process and people sent poetry and we aired poetry alongside short stories and that was great. This year I wanted to go a little bit deeper into the question of what poetry is. When I was working in a, as a school librarian, I used to start one of my lessons on poetry with the question, what is poetry? And one of my fifth graders came up with the best answer I have ever heard to that question. She said, it's just a bunch of words thrown together that when they come together sound right, which I thought was great. But I think the question of what is poetry and why poetry, those are important questions to be discussed. So we're going to go in depth with poets by introducing a new segment to the show. Poets Corner. The title of that segment is very intentional. Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey is one of my favorite places in the world to stand. I'm sure I have talked about it on the show before. You walk through Westminster Abbey and so many luminaries from history are buried there and it's this beautiful place and you get to this space and you're with Charles Dickens and you're with Lewis Carroll and there's also a section dedicated to the World War I poets, which is beautiful given the whole relationship with, with the war and history to poetry. It's a very cool place in which to stand. And I was in New York City in November and was able to sing at St. John the Divine Cathedral in Manhattan near Columbia University. Really cool experience to get to sing there. And... I did not realize until I was walking around that place that there was an attempt to make um, an American version of Poets Corner in St. John the Divine, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And that's also an impressive place to stand. And so when you stand in the presence of these writers and these poets from history, it makes you, I think, really think about the relationship between literature and society. And in a smaller more narrowly defined way that is what I want the segment Poets Corner to be. So for both of our remaining episodes in April I have invited a poet to share with us a their poetry and b to think about those questions. What is poetry? Why poetry? What do you say to people who don't read poetry? And so for the first of the Poets Corner segments I got to take a field trip and I'm going to bring you my little audio diary of a field trip I took to meet Kelly Russell Agadon, poet and publisher, in her office in Kingston. She's going to share with you some poetry, and then she and I are going to talk about why poetry, why small press, why is this so important. So I hope you enjoy that journey, and then at the end of the month we'll bring you a different kind of Poets Corner from a different voice. In terms of thinking about what stories to pair with this Poets Corner segment and what stories to bring you during Poetry Month, I wanted to do prose that reads like poetry. I wanted to pick pieces that would pair well alongside poetry and that would pair well into a discussion of Poetry Month. So we started with two short pieces, which I really love because they're about objects and they bring a language of literature, which is really important. And... We're ending with a piece that I just, it feels autobiographical, I'm sure it is, and when you hear it and hear what it's about, you'll also understand why it speaks to me in a different sort of way, and I think it's a really interesting piece to put into a conversation about writing in small presses. So that is today's episode. I hope you really enjoy my little field trip journey, hearing from Kelly Russell Agadon, and stay stick around for our final story of the episode, and... Pick up some poetry this month. Give it a read, give it a go, give it a try. And we'll see you next time here on No Extra Words. Hello, No Extra Words podcast listeners. This is Chris. Best laid plans. I'm on a ferry 
And when I booked this interview that I'm going to do with today's special guest, I had this image of myself on a ferry in the early part of March, standing on the deck watching the whales. And guys, it's freezing. <laughs> I'm standing on the upper deck of this ferry. I'm the only one here. It is sunny. It is beautiful. I'm looking at the white caps. Um, but believe me, I'm the only one out here. I'm watching the boat leave where I came from. So I can see the shoreline where my car is parked from here. Um, I used to live on an island, so I'm very familiar with these ferries. And my boyfriend at the time was the one who said that you should always ride in the back because that's where the view is the best <laughs> and the wind is the least. So yeah, I used to live on an island. Um, when I was 25 years old, I spent six months traveling in New Zealand and I had a couple of longer term places that I stayed while I was there. I worked in one town for six weeks and in one town for four. Um, and then when I got home, I took my very first library job ever on an island. And I used to say someday I'm gonna write a memoir about this time in my life and I'm gonna call it Islands. I haven't done that yet. Life's a little different now, but it is nice to stand here on this ferry and leave your life behind a little bit and watch the world go by. And I'm going to talk with our special guest in a little bit who does not live on an island, but who does live in this beautiful place that is accessed by ferry. She was kind enough to allow an invader from the other side of the water over town is what we used to call it when I lived on the island to come into her space and talk to her this whole theme of place is one that we've stumbled on accidentally here on this particular year of no extra words where we write and how where we write informs us and when I was looking for poets to be a part of this poets corner segment on the podcast I really wanted people who could speak to that and so I'm gonna snap a couple of pictures of the seagulls dancing with the waves out there and try to stay warm your attention please we are now arriving at our destination please make sure that you have all of your personal belongings before disembarking the vessel okay so this is a poem from my book letters from the emily dickinson room and it was inspired by um riding the Kingston Ferry to Edmonds um, almost every night when I was commuting. Yakima Ferry at Sunset. Tonight I could write a thousand poems no one should have to read. All around me are hippie grandmothers and gray-haired men with dream catchers hanging from their rearview mirrors of their Hondas. Everyone is irresistible tonight. The man in his NRA t-shirt, the child on the upper deck screaming about licorice, the woman who cut in front of me to buy a latte. I am skimming the edges like every poet on this boat, starting my sentences with the easiest words. I love, I love, I love to travel home by ferry. The women who smile at the men they don't know. How my tongue feels in my mouth. A sort of heaviness that never leaves. And this poem's also from Letters from the Emily Dickinson Room, which was published by White Pine Press. And the poem is called Memo to a Busy World, and it was um, actually a letter to God, and it was in such a busy time during my life that it ended up being just a memo to God because I was too busy for a full letter. It's called Memo to a Busy World. When God knew the gifts he had given me, he said, no give backs. And so with flora and fauna came the spiders, my father's disease eating through his veins. And when I knew sadness, God added slot machines persimmon martinis, tabloids of movie stars without their makeup. He told me to wait in the longest lines. I browsed horoscopes, bought Altoids and Star Magazine. 
I forgot the sweet breath of my husband sleeping next to me. I forgot how little I arrived with. Sometimes I notice the sunrise and am thankful for the sunrise. But mostly, I return to the white face of the monitor, the crinkled newspaper, the buzz of money. When he whispers, I don't always hear until a city disappears. Underwater, a building falls, a war begins. He knows what he has given me. The blackberry bush full of red-winged blackbirds, the song of circling bees. And I forget, trying to believe I can live on my own without being stung. Sure, we're live again. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are and what you do here and how long you've been doing this and okay. give us a little quick bio. Um, well, I'm Kelly Russell Agadon. I was a poet. I am a poet. I'm now an editor and a co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press here in Kingston, Washington. And we mostly publish poetry books, but we also publish memoir. And we do publish creativity tools like the Poet Tarot, and we do an advent calendar for poets in uh, for National Poetry Month where you write poems. So we're really interested in creativity and um, kind of stepping out of the box when it comes to small presses. So we're doing a lot of different things right now. And how long has the press been around? Uh, the press has been around <laughs> since 2010, and we've been in this office for almost two years. For um, a while, we were kind of working out of our kitchens and in coffee shops and all around. What inspired you to start a small press? Um, it was an accidental press. <laughs> it was started accidentally. We were on a ferry, and we were coming home from a reading event in Seattle, and we had both received e-readers, and we were looking for poetry books, and this was maybe 2008, 2009. And there were no poetry books because poetry comes late to everything. And so we said, wouldn't it be great if there was a women's anthology of poems? And there wasn't. And we said, yeah, someone should do that. And then we <laughs> said, well, we should do it. So we did it. And then we had to find a publisher. And we said, well, maybe we should just publish it. And then the next thing you know, we had started to Sylvia's Press. So watch out for fairy rides and a glass of wine. <laughs> it's the glass of wine that gets you every Yeah, you time. think you can do everything. And that's and, how it started. And about how many books do you do a year? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it's varying. This year we're doing, let's see, we have um, Kate DeGoot's memoir, The Authenticity Experiment, coming out. Um, two books of poems, two chapbooks. A book of poems, I don't know, maybe like four or five poetry books, and a memoir, and then sometimes a craft book, like we're going to do The Daily Poet too, which is writing prompts again. We'll have a book on um, publicizing poetry come out by Janine Hall Gailey. So it varies. What would your advice be to a writer who wanted to get published via a small press? How is that experience different? What would you tell them to look for, be aware of? Um, first is to be aware of... Um, the books they publish to see if you like the look of them because really that makes a big deal on whether you're going to appreciate to have your book be published by that. Um, it's good to know the people, support the press in other ways just to make sure that they're a press that you connect with. I think so much of publishing is finding a fit. Um, a small press can be great for a lot of people because we have a lot of freedoms. We work with our poets and writers on finding great covers and finding something they love and a lot of times if you go for a larger press they just say here's your cover here's your title um, and we believe it's a collaborative effort so um, yeah look around go to bookstores read and and um, submit to the places you love and whose books you love because most likely they're going to be a better fit for you
We usually do fiction on this show, but yeah. we're doing poetry this month because I always make, wherever I am, I always make everybody absorb some poetry during the month of April. I was a school librarian, so <laughs> it's like ingrained in me. So we were talking about this before we turned the mic on, but what, what do you tell people who say, oh, that's so cool, you're a poet, I never read poetry? Right, they say that. <laughs> or they think of, for a long time, they thought of Hallmark cards when you said you wrote poetry and then they think everything rhymes. Um, Poetry has changed. Um, it's really, I think for many of us, we were taught poetry incorrectly. We were taught, they start with Shakespeare and move forward. So you start with like old white men who say thou and and everything's rhymed and an iambic pentameter. Um, but if we start with poets that are writing today, they're writing in your language. And so I think a lot of people think, oh, I wouldn't understand it. And then they read it. And there's a lot of narrative poets that are telling stories, but in a very lyrical, musical, beautiful way. Um, and there are poets that are doing very, you know, wild experimental stuff. But there's also poems that are prose poems. And they're like short stories. So like almost like flash fiction. And there have been poems that have been published as flash fiction as well. So um, I would just say browse your poetry section and, and pick up a few things. It's not as scary as it seems. I just think it's always been taught a little backwards. I think if we started with poets writing today and then moved back to the dead folks, a lot more people would like it. Nice. What makes a poem a poem to you? You talked about how flash fiction can be a yeah. poem. And what, what's the line? Where does it become a poem? For me, so I started out as a fiction writer at the University of Washington. I was a fiction writer there, and I took a class by Linda Beards in my um, junior year, and that switched me. And I think the biggest distinction for me is that prose moves forward. It's, there's a constant, like, we're going forward, we're going somewhere, and poetry circles back. So there's a lot more repetition. You return to like certain themes or touchstones. And it has, not that prose doesn't have an emotional pull, but a lot of times you feel something in poetry and you're not exactly sure why you do it, why you're feeling that way. Um, poetry has been just described as best words, best order. And not that prose isn't, but I think when you're working in a smaller form, you have to be a little more specific with what you're saying because you only have this little stanza or page to say it in. Nice. But I think that's really the difference is that prose moves us forward, we're going somewhere, and poetry we keep almost circling back and reflecting on what, what was said, how it was said, kind of how it feels to you. So how do you describe yourself now when people ask what you do? Are you a poet? Are you an editor? Are you a fiction writer? Are you somebody who used to write fiction? Where yeah. are you at on that line? Well, it's easier to say that you're an editor at like a cocktail party than to say you're a poet because you get less people, you know, like feeling uncomfortable right. <laughs> and not knowing what to say. Right. Um, I, so what I usually say is I'm an editor who writes poetry and I write memoir nonfiction too. And uh, maybe maybe a failed fiction writer, a past fiction writer. <laughs> An ex-fiction writer. Ex-fiction writer, fiction. yeah. <laughs> I still occasionally write short stories, but I was doing much more of the novel-length stuff in my 20s. Gotcha. So. And one of the things we have stumbled upon in this show in this year, without really meaning to, is the whole theme of writing and place, which is why I really wanted to reach out to a Northwest yeah. writer, and I had no idea when I reached out to you that this is where we were going to be. Right. This is an audio, so I'm going to take a picture of, of where we are sitting, because we are <laughs> literally looking at the ferry dock right now, and if you look out your other window, you can see the park and the shoreline, and mm -hmm. so I am guessing that when it is windy and rainy here as it, as it is, it, you also get that feel, too, and so... Yeah. And we were talking about you are a native Northwesterner as well. So how does this place where you work now and the broader place of this region inform you as a writer? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, as we're looking out, so there's Seattle. There's the Seattle skyline if you look out oh, yeah, over there. And then on a clear day, you can see Mount Rainier. And so I grew up in Seattle and I remember our house was right by the freeway but there was a lot less trees and I remember being able from my parents room to see like just the top of Mount Rainier and how magical that was for me we have such a, a rich literary environment here poets and artists that are working and um, creating right now but you know past like Theodore Retke who was a poet who actually died on Bainbridge Island at, um, you may not know it at the Bloedel Reserve 
the Zen garden. He died in a, the, it was a pool, a swimming pool, and now it's a Zen garden. We have Richard Hugo over in Seattle, Denise Levertov. So I think just growing up in this, you know, city that has such, such a good literary feel and literary history, but also like why there's a lot of poets in Ireland, it's foggy and rainy, and that's why we have musicians too. We have to sit inside and entertain ourselves. That is very, it's, very true. So when we're not reading, we're painting, or we're writing, or we're making music, and then we get like our two months of summer, and we go back to work. So for me, I'm, I, and I love nature, and I love, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning all, I'm still learning all the birds. We're getting new ones because of climate change. You know, some of the more southern birds are showing up. Um, but no, I find all of that is just wonderful. And, and you can, like, you can be here right by the water, and then you're in downtown Seattle, and you're in a whole other experience. Right. And it's all within, you know, an hour from each other. Right. Where do you do most of your writing? Are you a person who has like a set, set space or are you somebody I, who writes in the wild? I did. I did. I used, I, my old house I just moved from in May had a, a writing shed in the backyard and I wrote in my shed. It was, it was built there so I could write. And now I have a table in my living room because I'm in a much smaller home and I'm still trying to get a feel for it. But I go up to, um, I go in writing residencies and even if I'm in the Northwest, there's a few around here um, where I just, if I can get a week, I can do a lot of work. But I try to write in the morning or the evenings or when things are quieter. It's harder, um, especially now that I don't have a dedicated space. I mean, I have a, I have a table and a desk and ear canceling head or ear, what is it, noise canceling right. headphones. Right. So um, I try to find my space wherever I can. This has been delightful, and I feel like I'm out of questions. Is there anything else <laughs> that you want us to know about you, about poetry, about writing, about publishing, about all the different hats that you wear? Yeah, no, I just, um, right now is a great time to support your independent bookseller and to support your small press and make sure that the authors and writers and artists in your life are getting a lot of love. And if you are a writer right now, or an artist, um, this is your time to be speaking out and getting your work into the world. I think it's more important right now than ever. That's, that's beautiful. I couldn't <laughs> have put that better. Thanks. Where do people find you? Online oh. and virtually, how do they connect with you? You can find our press online at twosylviaspress.com, and that's T-O-W, like two Sylvias. We were named after Sylvia Beach, um, who started Shakespeare and Company in Paris, and Sylvia Plath, the poet. Um, and you can find me, Kelly Russell Agadon, under agadon.com, A-G-O-D-O-N.com. And we're all over Facebook and Twitter. And do you have anything coming out or anything that you're promoting? I always like to give people a chance to sell themselves. Oh, no, I am working. I am in, I am in the creative part, so no books coming out yet, in, maybe in the next three years. But right now it's all about generating work <laughs> yeah. and revision. That's important. Well, Lots of revision. This has been amazing. Thank you for letting me come in, up yeah. and see your office and bring your voice to our listeners. It's Thank you. And thanks for taking the ferry over. It was great to have you uh, here. I always like to have an excuse to ride the ferry yeah, over. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Guidelines by T. E. Cowell. He sends another story to another magazine he doesn't read. He knows he shouldn't do this, that he should read not just some of the magazines he submits to, but all of them, or at the very least a story or two from them, so that he has a good idea what sort of fiction such magazines strive to publish. But he does it anyway. What's more, he submits to magazines he doesn't read fairly regularly. About as regularly, if he had to guess, as he submits to magazines he does read. Why does he do this when he knows he shouldn't? Because he doesn't have time to read every magazine that might possibly be a fit for his fiction, not with work and everything else going on. A lot of the magazines that he does read and submit to 
take a long time to get back to him about his submission, and nine times out of ten, they only accept one story at a time. He doesn't want to wait forever to hear back from these magazines before he can submit to them again. He has patience, he thinks, but not that much patience. He's always writing new stories, and he wants to be recognized for his writing sooner rather than later. His dream, as far-fetched as it sounds, as well as cliched, is to quit his day job and start writing full-time, or at least be able to devote more of his time to writing. He knows editors hate when writers submit to magazines they don't read. Or at least he knows some of them do, not from personal experience, but from reading certain magazine submission guidelines and putting two and two together. It should go without saying. Some magazine's guidelines say that you should read our magazine before submitting work to us. He knows you should. Knows that by submitting to magazines he doesn't read, he's potentially wasting both his time as well as the editors of such magazines. But still, he does it anyway. Sometimes, though... More often than not, though, he gets an encouraging rejection back from these magazines. A few times he's even gotten some stories published in magazines he's never read before, but that he starts to read after his stories published in them. He's even developed a rapport with a few such magazines that he now submits to quite regularly. And what about the magazines he reads before he submits to them? Do they republish his stuff? No. Not yet, at least. Most of the magazines he reads before submitting to are what are known as top-tier magazines. Magazines that if he were to get published in might potentially jumpstart his career as a writer. The magazines he doesn't read that he submits to probably wouldn't do too much as far as his career is concerned, but getting a story published anywhere is encouraging and keeps him, he thinks, writing on a more or less continual basis. He shouldn't be all that surprised then, and isn't really, when one day he gets a blunt email from the editor of a magazine he submitted to without first taking the time to read. The email goes something like this. It is clear to me that apart from not having familiarized yourself with our magazine before submitting to us, you also haven't taken the time to read our complete list of guidelines. If you had read all the guidelines, you would have learned that we do not publish stories about writers, period. I did take the time to read your story, though, and thought on the whole it wasn't bad, and that you might be able to place it with another magazine. But as for us, because you didn't heed our guidelines, don't worry, you're far from the only one. I personally ask you to please wait at least a year or two before submitting anything our way again. He reads the email twice over. His heart beats horribly as he does so. He feels like a hack. A fool. He vows that from this day forth he'll change his ways. Patience or lack thereof. Be damned. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.